the British people have spoken, and the answer is, we're out. To leave the European Union. Do solemnly swear. Alternative facts are not facts. W zgiełku i chaosie liczy się wiedza. To ona daje ci przestrzeń do myślenia. Polityka Insight. Dostarczamy wiedzę uporządkowaną i pogłębioną, a decyzje należą do ciebie. Welcome. Very nice to have you here. And uh, well, the word innovation was used in mul multiple forms and contexts by experts, uh, business. Uh, everyone speaks about the need to support startups, develop homegrown internet companies, or to implement cutting-edge technologies. This definition of innovation applies to developed economies. However, every country has its own potential, unique cultural conditions, as well as resources for growth. So first question for you, for a person with a background for working in different countries, what, what should Poland aim in the global race for creativity? Well, uh, if there was one simple answer, I would give it very briefly. Uh, it would take a bit longer. My conclusion at the end will be that we need to develop an industry, which I'm part of, which is called the connectivity industry, and we need to have more education. And I would like to try to loop together uh, some of the presentations we have had already. We heard the definition of Industry 4.0, uh, which is the, let's call it, automated self-managing value chain in the industry where basically everything should be connected, factories, the goods, the people managing the goods, and so on and so forth. And uh, by having everything connected, you can have a self-learning self mechanism so you can improve your productivity over time. We also heard uh, in the morning from <coughs> Mr. Morawiecki that uh, there's a lot of production in Poland, but that we would like to maybe leapfrog into some of the new developments. So what I'm coming to is that just in the presentation we just heard, we heard about infrastructure. And what was mentioned was railway, uh, highway, and airport. And if I claim something now, maybe I'm testing you, but I'm saying, if you hear now that the railways are closed tonight, nobody will have a big problem. You will take a car, you'll find another way to get home. Um, it will not be a serious issue. If the highway is closed, it will also not be a serious issue. You can go somewhere else. If the airport is closed, a lot of people will get upset, but they will fly tomorrow. I mean, Lufthansa has been on strike for many hours, many days, and nothing much happened to the German economy. But if I tell you that in the next six hours you cannot connect with your smartphone, everybody will panic. Um, and that's the sort of industry that seems to be a little bit forgotten that we need, when we talk Internet of Things, where today about 10 billion people or units are connected to the Internet. The expectation is by 2020, 100 billion units and people will be connected to the Internet, whereby it will be maximum 8.5 billion people and then the rest will be units. So cars, trains, airplanes, um, TV, radio, whatever we have. That's the industry where <coughs> the production of these units will be more and more automated, but they need to be connected. And in this country, there is no coherent public strategy for how do we actually make connectivity uh, more available. There's good programs to support the investment, but it's good to put a base station up on the roof somewhere, but to get a permit to actually use the base station is quite a hassle. And there needs to be, across the country, a consistent strategy for what is it we want to have in terms of connectivity and how can we use that in the future. And on the educational level, we also heard from Mr. Wittmer that there will be a lot of engineers needed in the future. And I would 
define it as, as three skills. One is the connectivity, so connect the units, the devices to the internet. The second is the cloud. As we heard, every, every one of us will have a clone in the cloud. Sounds scary, but we will. Uh, it's called Facebook. Uh, and the, the, all the units will also have a clone in the cloud, so we can actually compute the units. And that's the last skill, the compute. So connect, cloud, and compute will be an industry where production is no longer about cheap labor. Production is about having brain capacity and skill capacity to produce the goods that we are producing today in Poland, but much more efficient. And then when we eventually have produced them uh, efficiently, we can use the highway to drive them to Germany. Okay, so uh, we gave sort of a broad answer how it works and went through the, the basic fields. So about the, the, uh, the connectivity, about the need for strategy, about education. We'll come back to these points, but uh, well, my question will be what's different in Poland from, from the point of view? What assets do Poland have which differ it from, from other countries? How we can build innovation in this country? How it sh the, the Polish innovation can be different to, 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 to the global one or to, 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 to other countries? I believe that there's a lot of potential in Poland. Um, but we need to start with something that is credible, a positioning that is credible. If you look at um, countries like Italy, when you think Italy, you think food and wine. When you think Finland, you think a Nokia that's gone bust. And then you think design, or you, when you think about Scandinavia in general, it's about design. When you think about Germany, it's technology, it's engineering, and so on and so forth. And when you think Poland, I think today the ambassadors, most of the ambassadors for Poland, they're actually living in the UK. 830,000 ambassadors in the UK that are skilled, well-perceived, loyal, and hard-working. So if you today ask somebody out in Europe, what do you think about Poland, they will probably say, I wouldn't think so much about the country, but I would think about the people as those who are coming on time, producing or working hard, being highly skilled and very productive. So if you look at the brand Poland, I think you should begin to work with the brand and starting by putting it where people's thoughts are today. So that's something about high skill, loyal, hard working, good competence. And then over time, once you have established that brand of the country Poland, you can begin to move it in the direction you want to have it. But it's, you cannot begin with a position in saying we are technology leader. That is not credible today. It may be, a, it may be real, but it's not the perception. And therefore you cannot move the brand of the country Poland away from the perception. Start with a brand building of the country close to the perception and then begin to move it over time. Another question which was already posed in, uh, in this, on this conference is should Poland make up for the lost time or leapfrog? I mean, should we you know, do everything step by step as it was done in the West or jump into, I mean, both jump into the new technologies to things which are, which are more risky, uh, leapfrog, as, as, as they say. Both these, of these strategies have advantages and disadvantages. What do you think? I believe it's a very simple answer. It's leapfrog. And find some sectors where you can say, here we have the potential to really outpace the rest of Europe or the rest of the world for that matter. Just take one example, the financial sector. So we heard about a little bit before why we need, uh, why the state needs some companies. But if you look at the financial sector, one of the uh, developments uh, in Poland which has come late is the introduction of credit cards and also uh, so ATMs and so on and so forth, which means that you bypass a major investment in old technology and you can go straight to the latest generation. For instance, uh, the contactless credit card. So, for a fact, Poland has the highest penetration of contactless credit cards and credit card terminals in the entire world. It's a fantastic positioning. And you can use that positioning 
to leapfrog other technologies as well. We're saying, okay, we haven't invested like everybody else in old, let's call it incumbent infrastructure. We, we are at a, let's say, beginning compared to the rest of Europe or the rest of the world. And we can now, if we are creative and if we create the framework, we can actually leapfrog and begin to use technology that the others only can uh, dream about. I can only say when I've been visiting my family in Denmark for the last couple of years, and I've always been saying, you don't have contactless credit cards, it's much quicker, it's much faster, it's much safer, uh, and you can build services on top of that. The same will, if we come back to Industry 4.0, by establishing the correct infrastructure and the vast infrastructure enabling the Internet of Things, there is a possibility for Poland to be a leading country in Industry 4.0 production. Another subject which was already touched, but not from, from this side, was the uh, subject of Polish companies going abroad and uh, uh, about you know developing at other, uh, other mar markets, making contacts with, uh, with other companies. What do you think, what are the, the, the basic competencies which are needed in Polish companies to, to do more business abroad or export more? Let me start by answering another question or saying something else. Uh, the beauty about Poland is it's a big country. The, the problem with Poland, it's a big country. So what do I mean by that? First of all, by having already a big country, there's a big market, so many companies can actually flourish just by servicing the home market, which is a problem, and which is why smaller countries, Denmark being very small, Netherlands, Belgium, have been forced by nature and by, because of the size of the market out over the border and beginning to export to Germany, to the rest of Europe, to America, and so on and so forth. To do that, uh, you need a mindset, you need some education, and you need the openness to realize that across the border, the world may be looked different. I was recently um, uh, having a, or attending a presentation by a professor in, in, in labor, uh, labor behavior uh, from a Polish university, and looked at me and said, are you a Danish? Just to tell you one thing, it's not us who are different, it's you in Scandinavia uh, and the rest of the world look different than those in, in Scandinavia. But every country has its specifics and the way to learn how to deal with that is to interact. And interacting on the export market is not necessarily enough. It is also necessary to have the interaction in your home market. And it is a fact that the percentage of uh, non-Polish-born residents in this country is 0.6%, which is an extremely low percentage. And in other countries, in Germany it's 38 in Austria I think it's 8.6%, etc., which just gives from the very, let's say, the onset, a more multicultural uh, aspect and enables you, gives you some skills to work uh, across uh, different nations, transnational, uh, whatever, so this interaction will be helpful uh, in enabling export of the 4.0 industry products. So it boils down to, let's say, cultural factors too, not only economical. The last question, we don't have much time, only two minutes left, but actually we came back to education and its role in promoting business, innovation and, and export. This is what should what do business expect from, from, from the education in Poland? What do you need as, uh, uh, as, as major factors uh, from the, let's say, education sector? I believe it's very important that uh, the country, meaning the government, chooses some sectors where you say, we want to be strong here. We heard about uh, national championships over the last uh, many months, also the former government were talking about national champions and national champions are coming if you establish competence centers in different universities being it in industry 4.0 being it auto autonomous car being it in um, <coughs> robotics or whatever you cannot be world champion in everything 
is not possible. So you need to select in which areas, which sectors you want to be world champion and then build some strong clusters with passionate professors and you will see that at the end of the day there will be a lot of outcome from that cluster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this was the piece on innovation. We are moving to, to another subject and I think very different subject. Uh, does Poland have an image problem? We've read about Poland in foreign press and one, one of the people who are writing in the foreign press about Poland was Henry Foy, the correspondent of Financial Times in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Henry, <coughs> give a welcome to Henry Foy. Afternoon. So, uh, for many years, Poland was given as an example of transformation in our region of Europe. Uh, now it's not the case anymore, and you can we can see that image of Poland has uh, really deteriorated. Um, well, the basic question we really like to ask ask ourselves in, in this country, and, and it's quite often, it's what these Westerners actually really think about Poland. Um, I mean, look, you're right. Poland was held up as a great example of the success of the European expansion project, the, the, the spread of democracy, the spread of globalization, uh, 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 commercial uh, democracy, if you like. But that was branding. That was an image. That was a, an image that was branded by the previous government in this country and an image that was branded by the European Union because, in my opinion, uh, Poland, the European Union needs Poland to be a success more than the other way around uh, because it was, a, it was a big gamble, uh, what happened in 2004 for, for a lot of countries. And so the European Union has had to make Poland a success story. And I say this because now there are no problems in this country. It's just about branding. It's about image. It's about making a narrative that makes sense, uh, uh, the one that, one that fits. And I find this kind of question interesting, and I also find the attacks on myself and the other foreign media correspondents here interesting, because the government is kind of schizophrenic about foreign media. It says, we don't care about the foreign media. We don't care what they say. We don't, you know, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna treat them uh, the way that we treat Polish media, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, they get very affronted when, when we quote their ministers saying things, and that's really what we just do. We quote their ministers. Uh, you know, when it doesn't matter how many good stories there are about Poland, when a foreign investor reads something like Mr. Kaczynski sat on stage and Mr. Orban and said there must be a cultural counter-revolution in this country, they don't need the rest of the article that I write around it. They just need that quote. When Mr. Kaczynski tells Reuters before between Christmas and New Year, very slow period for news, by the way, which means it gets a lot of coverage. I don't mind if GDP falls, as long as we achieve our aims. Investors read that quote. They don't need the rest of the article. So really, Poland has an image problem, mainly because there's not branding going on. There's not a, there's not a message that's being put out and coherent. You know, what you're talking about, Jorgen, about branding, is, is all that's missing here. It's not, there's, there's not a huge difference between, between what, what's happening here and what happened before. It's about branding. And, and but Pavel, I asked you that question because I think if a lot of investors had heard what you just said, they'd be much more calm about the situation than if they hear quotes from ministers saying, we must repolonize the banking industry, we must take more control of the domestic industry. Because your arguments are, oh, they're good. You need a domestic venture capital industry. You need a, you need support for small countries, that, that are companies that are growing. Uh, the problem is that message doesn't get out enough. There's only, I would say, uh, three or four ministers or deputy ministers that actually care, that spend the time to talk to me and to other correspondents about what the real message is. The rest just ignore us. We've, I've, I've been asking for an interview with Mrs. Shudwa for 18 months. Every single month we get told, oh, call us next month, call us next month. She is the only head of state or head of government in the Visegrad that has not, and Orban doesn't talk to us either, but that, doesn't, that hasn't had an interview with the Financial Times. She's the prime minister of this country. Neither is the foreign minister. It, and then they say they're upset when we don't write about them. Well, talk to us. Well, uh, well the, the basic question is, I mean, on, on one, you, you keep saying Poland has a branding problem or, or image problem. How much is it uh, only image? How much is, is it a policy problem? I mean, there are certain things which are really on the plate of European Commission or Venice Commission, like, I don't know, constitutional tribunal, public media, a civil service, prosecutor office. I mean, these, these are the real things which happened in Polish legislation. So how much, how much of a real policy problem, how much of the, of the image? 
much is there? I can tell you that Poland would have less of an image problem if its response to the European Commission was, we're a democracy, we're a, so we're a sovereign nation, we're a government that has a majority and we're changing policy in a legal way. Instead of writing letters, making remarks about people's Nazi heritage, dragging up Second World War comparisons, I mean, that is basic branding. You could have taken that letter to Timmermans and taken out three or four lines and it wouldn't have made headlines. You know, it, it, that is a band, that's a branding problem, that's not a policy problem. Um, you know, there are lots of countries that are doing things the European Union don't like. But those countries work on their foreign relations and they work on their messaging. Um, you know, just take the region. Orban doesn't upset Mrs. Merkel, he doesn't upset the EPP. And so he's, he's fine, he's tolerated. Mr. Fizzo is in the Eurogroup. He pays his dues to the Greeks and he mouths off about immigration and he mouths off about the Greeks. But he pays his dues. Mr. Zeman, I mean, this man, Mr. Zeman is probably the most outspoken and, and critical leader in Europe. Way, way more critical than anybody in Poland. But it's not a problem because the Czech Foreign Ministry works very, very hard to say this man doesn't represent the Czech Republic, even though he won a national referendum. Uh, you know, it's all about how you maintain those those bonds. If Poland had very good relations with Berlin still, and and you know, Britain Brexit, you know, that's another issue. But with Paris with Brussels, maybe with, with, with The Hague, then this would be much, a much smaller problem. But Poland, like I said at the start, it, it seems to not care about what people think, but then also really care. Okay, so let's, sticking to, to your story of having image problem, how much this image problem deteriorates, let's say, the, the business atmosphere or, or making business in Poland? Some people, some people say that it's a real problem for the country. Some people say, you know, that if there are business opportunities in Poland, business will come here anyway. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that Poland's growing. It will continue to grow, I think, uh, maybe at different levels. Um, you can see from the announcements coming out of the development ministry that there's a lot of greenfield and brownfield investments still coming in. Of course, nobody knows how much would have been coming in before. Um, but I think FIIs are starting to have issues. You know, I, I, I don't know if, if is Michal Krupinski still here, but I interviewed him before Christmas and he said this is a big issue. Every time he goes on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a fundraising tour, they say we'd like to invest, but we have worries about political stability there. So no, I, I do think it will become a problem. The, the thing that people need to remember is that each little, each little point isn't in itself problematic. You know, the standoff with the European Commission over the court, that's, that's fine. You know. GDP starting to fall, oh, that's fine. That's fine. You know, the government buying up industry, parts of industries and also making noises about buying other industries. Yeah, that's okay. But you put all this together and it's just percentages, percentages, percentages. And so I, I don't think it would take that much. I think, like I said, there are two or three ministers that actually care. You know, we all know who they are, I don't need to name them. They go out, they talk to the foreign minister, the medias, they talk to the foreign investors, they, they, they work really, really hard. But I can't keep interviewing Mr. Szymanski and Mr. Morawiecki every single week to try to keep this branding up. You know, it, it requires the whole government to, to say, okay, we do, we do care, and this is an issue. And, and I think you'll start to see more and more strains in, in the government from people saying, look, we can't keep this up. We can't, you know, we can't have one and the other. We need to have a coordinated message here. Well, uh, this image problem doesn't work only for business, but also for international politics, especially in European Union. And uh, there was the time that the whole energy of Polish diplomats in Brussels were trying to contain the constitutional crisis. What do you think can be an impact of this image problem for Polish position in European Union? I mean, sorry, your question. Where are we in European Union with, with you know, after, after all this conflict over, over constitutional trip? No. Well, even taking into account that, that you treat it mainly as an as a image, image problem, where does it leave us in, in European Union, in you know, our capacity to sure. deal with our business in European Union? Sure. I mean, Poland was given a seat at the top table. It's one of the big six. It's, you know, it's got the most, it's got a large number of QMB votes in council. It, it, it throws its weight around. Mr. Tusk's um, position was, was, a, was a reflection of that. I don't think that will recede. I think more problematic is Poland's relations with the other member states. That is, that is something that actually really counts. 
Uh, I think people really underestimate how powerful the Merkel-Tusk relationship was. Uh, and, you know, I can see why members of the current government might not like that kind of thing, but it's real politic. Like, you don't have to like these people. Hold your nose and use their, use their influence. You know, this is the way the world works. Um, I, with, with the Constitutional Court thing, I don't know. I, I get a sense from the Commission that... You know, there are no legal ways for the Commission to, 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 to punish them. Let's, they let's use another example. So, po position of Poland or, or the region with the migrants crisis, right? This is something which I hear from diplomats from, from different countries that, you know, we, you, you as, as a country didn't show enough solidarity and, you know, we'll pay you back. I think after the German election you'll see that. You'll see, you know, we'll keep this one in our back pocket. You know, we called for solidarity. We've given you guys solidarity in the past, and basically solidarity works towards Germany in one way, that's money. You know, the Germans should pay for everything. But when those Germans call for solidarity, everyone says, well, I'm not, well, I'm not sure, you know, you can't tell us what to do, that's, uh, that, that's not fair. Um, so I do think that will, that will come back uh, to bite. I, from what I hear from the Commission, they are not actively punishing Poland in terms of granting money or granting projects, but the ease with which the machine used to run towards Poland, which is, oh, you know, this, this piece of paper is missing a signature and this bridge, you know, maybe it's going to cost a bit more than that, but whatever, we'll, we'll run it through because it's Poland. That's stopped. So they're getting the same treatment as everybody else, uh, which isn't as good as it was before. But, but one thing to say, this isn't just about the government. I mean, you look at the, the, what happened over Christmas, you know, that was bad for Poland's image. And it was arguably not law and justice's fault. You know, the, the, the scale of, of what, what took place over Christmas and the standoff there was, was partly, I mean, I personally think majority of probably the opposition in the way they, they, they acted. So this isn't just about the government, it's about the general sort of political narrative in this country. And, and, and it's just, it, it, would, it would take tiny tweaks. Law and justice employed a professional international PR company for their election campaign. That's why it was so slick. It was really good, right? It was brilliant, it won. And then they drop the, P the PR company, you know, and then they say, well, why, why does everyone hate us now? Well, you know, it, th th these things, everyone uses professional PR companies. And they look for one in London, and a certain newspaper broke the story that, that, it, that it, they're looking for one, and they drop the idea. And I just thought, this is silly, you know, th this is silly. It, it takes so little sometimes just to, just to tweak the image, and that's all that needs to be done. Yeah. This is the next question. So are these changes irreversible? I mean... You can still make it up, what do you think? Completely, completely, it's completely reversible. Um, what, what would you advise? Just, it's about moderating the language. You know, you can be strong and stand up to the European Commission, with, like I say, without talking about the Second World War, without referring to Nazis. You know, it's, it's, it's water under the bridge for Europe, you know. It, 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 it isn't diplomatic language, especially in public. Like, if you bring it up in meetings, fine. If you're going to write open letters, um, you, you kind of get what's coming for you, you know, and you, people will, 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 will treat you that way. I think it would, it would be about language, yeah, rhetoric. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to write about. The, the French, the, the Spanish, they push back against the European Commission all the time, but they do it in, in diplomatic language, and, and they don't give off the impression it's us versus them, you know. And I think Poland does need to work out where it stands on this. You're a skeptic versus you're a realist. You know, you have Kaczynski talking about treaty change. You have Szymanski saying, you know, the EU is fine, but we need to change the way it runs. We need to, like, be a bit more realistic. You know, where does the party stand? I think would make a lot of people in Brussels a lot more calm. Um, you know, the European Union is very popular here. You, you look at the surveys, but you talk to the politicians, it doesn't sound like that. Or at least you read what they're saying, it doesn't sound like that. Coming back to business perspective, we've been to Brussels and to, to other capitals. Uh, the foreign business here, you know, we've heard before on, on this conference that there are different words. Polonization, domestication and nationalization. Uh, I mean, when business hears these kind of words, uh, it's pretty mix up everything. With, I mean, it's pretty to mix up one with another and uh, it doesn't create a, a very friendly envir environment. What do you think about the business perspective? What can change, what should change to, to make Polish image better? In, in the eyes of business. Well, I mean, if, if the government said we're not going to encourage companies to sell to us, if they came out and said we are not going to, we're not on the market to buy any more companies, yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be a great way of doing it. But they won't, they won't say that because, because that would sort of show some kind of retreat, I imagine, on a program. I mean, it, 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 you, you, other governments buy companies 
but they don't have the minister going on TV like once a week and saying, yeah, we're looking for companies to buy. I mean, what, how does that make you feel as a foreign owner of a media asset, of a, of a telecom asset, of maybe of, a, of, a, of an energy asset, of a, of a military asset? You know, it makes you feel pretty worried. If you're a banker, you know, Which brings us back to the first question, is it image or policy? When you hear, for example, I don't know, of energy asset of EDF, which, you know, government actually made EDF sell it to Polish companies, not to the, to the Australian and Czech one, right? I mean, that, that's, that, I mean, that's pure, that's, that's just, but that's just a mistake. You know, you don't, you, you find another way around that. You know, you fudge it. You, you, you change the deal of the tender to make it. The same with the Airbus deal. I mean, there are ways to let down other companies without doing it in such a ham-fisted, actually, you know what, we'll build it ourselves, thanks a lot. Um, I know it was all legal, a lot of these, a lot of these things are all completely by the book, but it's, it's the, the mannerism in which, in which you go about it. And, you know, I, for me, it's unnecessary. You know, they, they, this, this country is, is, is run by a government that completely deserves to be in charge, completely deserves to do whatever it likes because it won a majority. I don't know, it doesn't have to act like sort of bully boys in the classroom. It, 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 it can be a very well-functioning European power. I, 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 I don't get this whole animosity and the need for the, the, the rhetoric. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't see how it's actually beneficial because the core voters that we assume love this kind of rhetoric probably don't, probably don't care about Juncker and Tusk. And, you know, who, who cares? Thank you very much, Henry. We had. Uh, I actually just want to say, um, I've had a fantastic two and a half years here uh, and I've, I, my flat was packed up today, so I'm officially on the way out on Wednesday. And um, So thank you very much to, to PI for having me today, but also to, to all of you um, who've hosted me and, and looked after me at many conferences and events over the last two and a half years. Um, please keep reading the Financial Times, and you'll see my successor um, in Warsaw very soon. Thank you. A generation which on one hand is a, a sizable uh, part of the labor market, all the people born from uh, uh, 84, so at the age of uh, 35, what are these young people? We have a sociologist, Kristina uh, Szafraniec, who is with us. Professor. There is a lot of uh, negative stereotypes around young people. We hear that they are long-term oriented, they, they, they don't want to uh, work hard, that they are a generation which wants to have s and everything uh, immediately, that they are very demanding. Let us try to um, dismantle these bombs uh, and then talk about the details and according to this uh, division of the social roles that these uh, young people play. So how they are as uh, employees? We have many employers uh, and they complain that these uh, young persons are long-term uh, oriented, uh, contrary to the old um, colleagues that they are very demanding that they are not long-term uh, oriented. Where are these uh, stereotypes uh, taken from? I would start with a surprise that the, the features that you enumerate, that they are short-term, that they are not getting involved in their duties, that they are lazy, apart from the last feature, they sound like an allegation which these young persons uh, attribute to themselves as their positive choice, as a certain value that they cherish. Such uh, features of professional behavior are a result of the situation on the labor market. It is the temporary contracts which are being offered uh, to uh, the majority of the young persons in the age group 24-30 are the reasons why uh, you cannot plan your career which young persons uh, dream about. Everyone who enters the labor market would like to see a clear career path. Would like 
to some of the experiments along the career paths into something which makes sense. So for these young persons, this is a very un uncomfortable situation. And of course, uh, the employers are complaining that they are short-term. It is uh, also uh, uncomfortable for employers. But this is the times that we live in. This is the specificity of the contemporary capitalism and the contemporary labor market, which uh, has in its uh, DNA uh, a fragmented, uh, dispersed uh, labor market. What's more? Is it more that they don't? Uh, we, well, we remember the old uh, models of career when you would uh, get promoted over many years. Is it because they are different that they uh, appreciate it, uh, uh, don't appreciate this model? Well, we are generalizing that this generation is, has certain features, but it is a very varied generation from the point of view of uh, observing made by big corporations. It is different in case of province or not as well educated people who don't have uh, interesting uh, professional competencies. So there is no one question to you, no answer to your question. Uh, certainly those who have uh, some competencies to offer is generally an ambitious uh, generation which was born uh, in the times of great hopes and expectations and they really got very much into it. There's only a fraction of people who are um, living this uh, train. Most of them would like to have an interesting career. However, just unlike in case of my generation, uh, the work or the career is not the most important uh, value. It's a crucial value. A good work opens work to the, an interesting uh, lifestyle. This is uh, the most important future. They want to live in an interesting way. They want to live in, in, in a way which means that the work is not um, boring. I should not get bored. I don't want to be this rank and file employee. And uh, the promotion is something which uh, a, a high level dream that they are not giving up on. However, it is uh, difficult to um, foresee and to plan in, in a situation where, where, where uh, a labor market is not uh, uh, very friendly to young persons and the changed uh, workplaces are not creating a a reasonable pattern. So one of the most basic uh, expectations is to be able to develop professionally. This is a, an enigmatic uh, term, but this professional devel development means that uh, I will be able to move uh, towards uh, consecutive stages or to move within the hierarchy, professional hierarchy. So this is something which is important for them. And persons are completely different. Uh, persons than the, the previous generation, 10 years uh, older. So uh, well, are they no, no longer so interested in some fixed uh, uh, value in uh, assets just like uh, uh, apartments and uh, cars and so on. <laughs> or is it the employment market? It's both on one hand, both uh, older persons and millennials are a, are a pragmatic and very materialistic uh, generation. This generation was shaped by uh, cons con consumption uh, ideology, which is uh, a different message to the, uh, to the career model that you are showing to people how interesting you can live where various goods and certain lifestyle which is connected with a social position is very accessible. And uh, under the influence of such a cultural message, they were growing up. So having a position, a 
a car and an, a, an apartment is, is important, but they have a different philosophy. It's not to boast it, but it serves the purpose of uh, getting some um, pleasure and to arrange individual lifestyles. This is one thing, but the second thing, entering, entering the adulthood when they could be um, independent consumers, coincided with very difficult uh, economic times. These are persons who have difficulties uh, entering the uh, employment market and have difficulties to uh, keep it up. And the offers uh, of work for them uh, are least interesting. They are earning less. They are continuously facing the necessity of changing their jobs so they don't have the means to buy houses, uh, cars. They prefer either ersatz or they just try to get by. And this is a drama of this generation which was uh, grown up to consume, must uh, apply such uh, strategies which force them to make such professional choices which enable you to su survive. You can hear the dialogues uh, between the um, representatives of older generations. Uh, I would take this internship for two years uh, and I would work for free and then I, I would take a good job. Um, and the younger persons would say that uh, if I agreed to it, uh, I would spend 10 years uh, working without any pay. So this uh, internship period is much uh, longer for them. Well, uh, this is a simple thing. When you are 20, everyone around you, the, well, you feel this internal voice that you should grow up, and everyone around you t t tells you do something about it, have a job, uh, get stabilized, uh, start a family. And in my uh, generation, um, such uh, things happen when we were 23, 24 today. An adulthood has reached uh, in the first half of the fourth decade of life. This is an uh, unbelievably um, postponed period of entering the adulthood, very uncomfortable for these young persons who being uh, adult per se, cannot pursue life uh, in accordance with the scenario that the um, uh, upbringing process was preparing them for and the social uh, influences. So on, on one hand, there is this pattern that they should be grown up. On the other hand, growing up uh, is much more difficult due to uh, various reasons. And for this generation, it is yes, yet another drama because uh, the work, which is a key to be able to um, to grow up, is uh, the most difficult good. Uh, and if you get it, there is a difficulty to negotiate with the labor market, with an employer, what they expect from me. And in this uncertainty and in this hybrid nature of Polish labor market and of the both expectations and benefits on both sides, we see, we see both employees and employers. So it's not that only employers can complain that they are lazy, that employees are not getting involved because they are not very creative. Uh, just, uh, just, uh, just as well, and it is um, confirmed by the sociologists, uh, it is the millennials who are living in a great discomfort. Thank you, Professor. I realize that we are able to uh, just uh, touch on a topic, and I promise that we will be back to it. Thank you, Professor. I would like to thank the whole panel.